So about a month ago, I was thinking about a question that one of my teachers asked me last year. What do you think is the most important invention of the last 500 years? There's a lot of inventions that have completely changed our lives. For example, smartphones, nuclear power, or even the airplane. But then I thought of something else, antibiotics. We take them for granted, but when they were first invented, they were a complete game changer. After their widespread use, the rates of death from a lot of infectious diseases plummeted. Average lifespans increased, and overall our quality of life improved. The problem nowadays is that we forgot about pretty much all of this. We take this marvelous invention for granted. You see, when we're in developed countries like the United States, the presence like a lot of advanced medical technology and drugs like antibiotics isn't really a surprise. But sometimes we act like everyone on the planet has the same access to the medical technology that we do. And that isn't the case. In a lot of third world countries, medical supplies that we take for granted, like antibiotics, are a godsend. They have the same impact in those countries that they did in this country a hundred years ago. And that's what I want to focus on today. How medical care in this day and age is so dependent on your socioeconomic status and where you live. How are we working to fix this issue and what tools are we using to fix this issue? Now before we answer that question, I want to take a second to talk about something completely different. But trust me, we'll bring it back to the subject of medical equity in a while. Before that, I want to take a minute to talk about AI, or artificial intelligence. I like to compare AI to blockchain. See, if I go to my friends and family and ask, hey, what do you know about blockchain? They might know a little bit about what it is, and they might know a little bit about where it's being used. But then if I ask them, hey, how does blockchain work? They'll have no idea, and that's because to the majority of us, blockchain is essentially powered by dark magic. Now, I want to talk about how AI works so we don't fall into the same pitfall with AI that we do with blockchain. Now, the goal of AI is really quite simple. We're trying to make machines provide human-like responses when given some set of input data. Now, to be fair, that definition is somewhat broad, but it does cover the general concept of AI. AI algorithms are varied. There are several subsets of the AI field. And today, I'd like to focus on one specific subset of AI called deep learning. Deep learning algorithms are made of several layers of neurons. Now, that sounds a little bit confusing, but think of it as us trying to mimic the human brain. And that's actually why we call the components the layers of this type of model neurons, because our brains, the cells in our brains, are made of cells called neurons. So basically, when we give deep learning models a set of input data, it gets filtered through each of these different layers. And each layer does something unique to that data. You know, it could highlight something, it could add something to that data. We don't know what it does. It's like an assembly line, right? Each layer adds or highlights something in that input. A given model has a certain number of layers, and whoever makes the model can decide the number of layers. So after the input data goes through all of the layers, you know, we can return it as an output, and we can use that output for whatever we need to do. So here's an example. If I wanted to create a deep learning algorithm to classify cars, the first layer might focus on the color of the car, the second might focus on the doors and the wheels and where they are. The last one may look for headlights or taillights. Based on all of the data that each of these layers tells us, we can figure out if the image contains a car or not. Now, AI has a lot of uses in a lot of different industries. We can use it to predict weather patterns for farmers. We can use it to drive cars without a human. We can even use it to judge beauty contests, and I'm not even joking about that last one. In 2016, there was a beauty contest that used a panel of AI algorithm as its judges. But in my opinion, the most important use of AI to date is in healthcare. AI is being used pretty much everywhere in healthcare to augment or outright replace the abilities of traditional doctors. Now, one of its many use cases in the healthcare industry is clinician decision support. You see, when a patient enters a clinic, they don't bring a detailed list of symptoms and an educated guess of what's causing their pain, because that's what the doctors do. The doctors have to ask questions to their patients. They need to run tests. They have to consult specialists. The problem is, all of this can take several weeks to accomplish. But AI can do all of this in a fraction of the time with a much higher accuracy. In fact, some estimates say that an AI algorithm can do all of the work that a doctor takes weeks to do in a matter of hours. It's not just that either. AI algorithms could save hospitals billions of dollars. According to the executive chairman of Firefly Health, which is a company designed to streamline healthcare uh, systems, 
$91 billion a year are wasted due to inefficient administration policies. Hospitals could use specially trained AI algorithms in these areas to save money. They would reinvest all of this money into better patient care, which is the most important thing that they provide. In most cases, the, most, the only thing that limits most of these AI systems are the data. But in the healthcare industry, there's a mountain of data for each patient, making it easy to train and deploy models. But AI can do much more than just basic data analytics. We're using AI to identify problematic areas in MRI scans. We're using AI to create brand new types of drugs. And we're even using it to diagnose cancer itself. You know, cancer has been a problem that's been plaguing us for centuries, ever since the dawn of human society. Right now, we have two major problems when dealing with cancer, diagnosing the patient and treating the tumor. Diagnosing the patient earlier allows us to begin treatment earlier, and AI can actually help us with this. You see, there are hundreds of cancer databases online that are hosted by governments, private individuals, and companies alike. And since these databases are so large, each of them contains tens of thousands of images, AI algorithms trained with all of this data are extremely accurate. For example, Path AI, which is a company that specializes in healthcare-focused AI, is working on a cancer algorithm designed to help diagnosing cancer earlier. Freenome is another AI company that actually created a similar tool. These AI algorithms are being used in blood work, they're being used in diagnostic tests, they're being used in screenings. Now, all of this data is combined and given to clinicians so that they can get an accurate image of a patient's overall health. AI isn't just limited to diagnosis either. Several teams of researchers have begun to explore the possibility of AI in creating treatments for several other challenging diseases. Antibiotic-resistant bacteria are one of these problems. These days, we're using antibiotics as a treatment for pretty much everything. But the more we use them, the less effective they become. Bacteria are constantly evolving, and every so often, a bacteria becomes resistant to an antibiotic. Now, this is happening more and more and more. They're rendering nearly all of our medical technology and antibiotics useless. The problem is that our antibiotics take billions of dollars and several years to design, so we can't hope to keep up with the rate of mutation of bacteria. But AI might have the solution to this problem. AI-created antibiotics take much less cash and much less time to create. The strategy has already been proven. There is a team of researchers at MIT that used a machine learning algorithm to find a new antibiotic named Halicin. It's not just in research purposes either. Several companies are looking into this. IBM created an AI that's designed to create peptide chains. You can think of peptide chains as basically the ingredients of proteins. After peptide chains are made, our body can turn them into functional proteins. The AI actually has seen success. It's been able to generate two peptide structures, or think again, proteins, which have been shown to be effective against a variety of pathogens. Everything I've been talking about relies on millions of dollars in research. It relies on dedicated AI labs, and you need to have professional computer scientists. But the most important thing about AI nowadays is how easy it is to get started. I actually have experience in using AI to deal with some of these hard to diagnose diseases. I wanna talk a little bit about my experience using AI to you guys. You see, when I was in elementary school, maybe around the third grade, I was playing outside in the woods one day, but unfortunately, I got bitten by a tick, and I didn't know. Over the next few months, I started feeling worse and worse, and at one point, I couldn't even move my legs without excruciating pain. The only hint I had about my condition was a red, bullseye-shaped rash on my arm. My family and I were naturally concerned. What exactly was this thing on my arm? So we went to a clinic, but they just brushed it aside as some sort of regular mosquito bite or insect bite. But luckily, a blood test later revealed that I actually had Lyme disease. And if I'd been diagnosed just a little bit later, maybe a week or two later, it could have been much worse. I could have been stuck with the chronic symptoms of Lyme disease, like Lyme arthritis, for the rest of my life without that blood test. For the next few years of my life, I just tried to forget about that entire experience because it was extremely painful. But when I was in ninth grade, my computer science teacher spent a day teaching us about a subfield of artificial intelligence called computer vision and an idea sprung into my head. Could I use the power of AI to diagnose bullseye rashes and by extension Lyme disease? Because if I could, then that could mean that I could stop other people from going through the same experience that I had. The only problem was that I knew literally nothing about computer vision. But that didn't stop me. I spent the next few months studying harder than ever. I sent emails to the senior lab teachers asking for 
lab materials related to computer vision. I went online and took a few courses on computer vision from Coursera and edX and any website available. I even went on to a place called Kaggle.com and practiced machine learning competitions. I participated in them to hone my skills. But at the end of that period, the end of that several months of studying, I was finally ready. I collected data on Lyme disease rashes with the help of a researcher at the NIH that I managed to contact. I even managed to train a model on that data and ended up having an accuracy of above 90%. I managed to implement that model into an app after I studied app development for you know, another few months. But developing an app like this meant that diagnosis could occur on the go. That app had several purposes. Most notably, it can help doctors pre-screen patients for Lyme disease. And it can help diagnose Lyme disease in places without the best medical facilities like Africa or India. Now, why am I telling you about this? You see, when I talk to AI with my friends and family, they see it at this they see it as this mystical, magical field that only computer nerds can work in successfully. But that simply isn't the case. With enough effort, even a high school student like myself can create an AI algorithm to diagnose a disease that has plagued doctors for decades. You know, AI certainly isn't easy, not by a long shot, but it isn't impossible. AI is gonna pave the way towards better healthcare for everyone. You see how, you've seen how AI can create medicine make hospitals more efficient, and generally improve people's well-being. So learning about AI and how to make AI algorithms is going to be a vital skill in the next few decades. Just spend an hour or two each week taking a course or just reading an article. So I hope you've learned something from this talk. Maybe even you can use AI in your life to solve some problems that are in your community. Trust me, it really isn't that hard. Thank you.